Um, I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of the Bibliographical Society of America. My name is Erin McGurl and I'm the executive director. Um, I will start uh, this panel, Black, Selling, Black Bestselling Books and Bibliographical Concerns, a conversation between Kanohi Nishikawa and Jacinta R. Saffold. Um, in a moment here after taking care of some minor housekeeping. As you can see, uh, we are providing closed captioning for this event. If you wish to see these captions in Spanish, you can do so using the link that I've just put into the chat. I'm also reminding you that this uh, virtual event is covered by our events code of conduct. Um, please do abide by the guidelines that we set forth for this community during today's event. Last but not least, we will be using the Q&A feature for the discussion um, with the panelists during today's event. If you want to ask a question, please do that using the Q&A button. And if you want to discuss what is happening during the event and comment on the conversation, we encourage you warmly to do that in the chat. Um, just that chat is not the best place to ask the presenters a question during the Q&A session. So without further ado, I am delighted to introduce Jacinta R. Saffold. She is, Af an, is an African-American literary scholar invested in how 20th and 21st century fiction helped construct and contest intersections of race, gender, class, age, and geography on metropolitan cityscapes of the African diaspora. Assistant Professor of English at the University of New Orleans, she is developing her manuscripts, books, and beats the cultural kinship of street lip and hip hop. Her work has appeared in or is forthcoming in Words, Beats, and Life and the Metropolitan University's Journal. Dr. Sassfold is also the inaugural 2021 Dorothy Porter Wesley Fellow at the Bibliographical Society of America. So I'm very, very pleased and proud to introduce today Jacinta and ask you to please take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Erin. And I would like to say a very deep and sincere thank you to the Bibliographical Society of America, not only for uh, the fellowship. I had no idea that um, the Dorothy Porter Wesley Fellowship existed um, when I applied, but thank you all for choosing me to be the inaugural fellow for that. I am just... Uh, overjoyed at the honor to be uh, named a fellow um, in honor of Dorothy Porter Wesley, an amazing black bibliograph bibliographer. Um, and so I want to introduce who will be interviewing me today. Kenohi Nikisawa is an associate professor of English and African-American studies at Princeton University. His amazing book, Street Players, Black Pulp Fiction and the Making of a Literary Underground was published in 2018. Um, and he has several essays and book chapters on black print culture and publishing. He is currently at work on a book titled Black Paratext, Reading African-American Literature by Design. Thank you so much for being willing to join me in conversation about um, this project that I've been working on since 2015. I was so delighted to share it with you and I'm looking forward to some questions from you. Well, thank you, Jacinta, for inviting me to have this conversation with you. And thanks to everyone assembled for um, really sort of hearing uh, with us about this uh, uh, incredible project that Jacinta has been working on. Um, this marks the project's uh, debut to a wider public. And um, based on what I've seen, I think the implications of the project are incredible for a number of fields. So I think um, this is a moment of celebration as well as a moment where we get to learn more about um, the project and your stake in it. So um, by way of introduction, um, I think that all of us would just love to hear a little bit more about the Essence Book Project. BSA had a great um, opening slide to welcome everyone into the room where we saw those uh, um, 
envelopes <laughs> that used to come in our subscription magazines. Um, I still get magazines delivered to my door. I, I can't seem to, uh, you know, kick the print habit, as I'm sure many uh, folks in the room uh, can understand. Um, but tell us a little bit more about the Essence Book Project. What was your inspiration behind creating it? And in general, what insights do you think can be gleaned from studying Black bestsellers? That's a really great opening question. So uh, this project really grew out of a need uh, for archival and primary sources to really understand the literary landscape at the turn of the 21st century. When I started working uh, with this a genre of uh, literature, I had more questions than answers. And uh, one of the biggest questions that I had that just felt very um, monumental to be able to ask was uh, based on uh, some book covers that I wanna show you. So I'm gonna share my screen now. So uh, one of the major books that I consider in my forthcoming manuscripts, books and beats is The Coldest Winter Ever. And one of the, uh, and several of the editions of this um, book have things like over 1 million copies sold or author of New York Times bestseller um, the, for the sequel of The Coldest Winter Ever, which is Midnight or national bestseller and over a million copies sold and, and all of these wonderful accolades. Um, and so then I began to ask questions about how do we verify this information? How do we know uh, that this novel really sold as much as, as it is purported to have sold. Where do I get this information? And so I started with the a more obvious sources to me, which is Nielsen Book Scan and um, online data from major retailers like Barnes and Noble and Amazon. Um, and I didn't find very much inf fruitful information, any sort of um, statistical information whatsoever. <laughs> And so then my question, so then I, I, I hit a wall and I started asking questions and I had a conversation with another author, uh, Omar Tyree, uh, about this issue because he is also one of the foremost bestsellers of this era. And he, he laughed in my face and told me, you won't find that information. And I said, oh, well, why not? And he said, majority of uh, us, these authors have had to work in um, non-traditional ways to be able to have our books heard, um, to be published. Uh, the ways that we have, the networks and the ways that we have to work look different than traditional methods and what you're trying to do are very traditional things. And so if you're looking to see where these books sold and how many times and those sorts of things, you're not gonna find that information, but you can find other things. And uh, around that same time, I was in the Library of Congress every, every chance that I could get, I was um, an admissions officer at Howard University. And so I would sneak off to the Library of Congress and after a year of trying to get hip hop magazines printed and published in the 90s and early 2000s, I finally got frustrated enough to widen my search just to African American culture magazines, which included Essence. And the first issue that I, I picked up had The Coldest Winter Ever by Sister Soldier plastered, plastered on uh, the, the list and the number one position and I just I my heart skipped a beat that I was so excited and after the 15th issue of the magazine that had this book ranked as the number one bestseller I said I can't keep track of this just mentally I think I, I need to do something more to be able to track this data so just to give you all a, a reminder of what this is or a first look if you um, haven't subscribed to Essence or picked one up in the last 30 years. Um, the list usually would be published in the back of the magazine alongside um, various advertisements and other kind of housekeeping notes from the magazine. Um, but it was a, a staple from 1994 to 2010. Uh, and uh, the list is broken down into four sections, hardcover fiction, 
uh, hardcover nonfiction and paperback fiction and paperback nonfiction. Um, and so the, the list is a very surprising kind of um, collection of, of various works written for, about, and by uh, Black people. And, I, and I'm in intentionally using the word Black rather than African-American because what I have come to find is that this list is, is quite expansive. It has titles um, that were published long before uh, the list came along. For example, The Souls of Black Folks and um, The Miseducation of the Negro um, and a few other kind of classical uh, African-American text, but it also has texts that um, move beyond the bounds of uh, the geographical bounds of the United States and has a fuller uh, 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 articulation of the African diaspora. Well, this is quite an incredible introduction and I appreciate the visuals that you're sharing with us because for a majority of our audience, this is their first sight of the Essence bestseller list. And perhaps even for some, uh, their introduction to Essence itself. I think we're just getting started here. And um, by way of preview, if you have a question, please put it in the chat and we're gonna devote about 30 to 40 minutes at the end to answer them. Um, but we're just getting started here. I have so many questions I wanna ask you, but I wanna maybe dig into the numbers a little bit, if that's okay, Jacinta. Um, the Essence Book Project is not only a kind of cultural and historical recovery of these lists, but also a kind of, um, uh, systematization of the, the titles and books that it contains, uh, first ever attempt at doing so. So I wonder if you could give us some numbers to attach to the scope of the collection. Um, you already gave us the dates 1994 to 2010. Um, do you have a sense of how many titles are represented and how many authors within those parameters? Absolutely. So um, for the uh, list for fiction, it, there are nearly 500 titles. Um, I believe the number is 498 to be exact. Um, I can't give you a specific information about the nonfiction um, list because that is still ongoing. This project is still um, developing and uh, the uh, amount of authors I believe um, is between 250 and 300 authors and uh, what I neglected to tell you um, is that this list was uh, created the uh, through a data schema of collecting uh, sales information from independently owned black bookstores across the United States so not only is this a list a copy of fairly comprehensive list of um, titles of, uh, within the Black experience from the 90s and early 2000s, but also a snapshot of what Black-owned bookstores um, looked like and the vibrancy of uh, therein um, at the turn of a new millennia. And so I want to show you specifically, for example, this list that I have here um, in the reporting source that it has. Some of the lists provide um, actual uh, information uh, to um, contact the booksellers. Um, so they'll put phone numbers or email addresses. <laughs> and this was, keep in mind, uh, very early internet. So um, the ways that we communicated then and the ways that we communicate now are a little different. But I, I think it's wonderful um, to see how many uh, books that bookstores were in service and how this, this list really was representative of uh, Black communities' concerns within the United States. And um, the, the list itself provides uh, um, over 250 independently owned Black bookstores. I was going to let one of our audience members ask about reporting, but this really gets at that. And needless to say, the way they compiled these lists itself opens out onto 
um, a whole history and network of Black bookstores and readerships, um, a history that in some ways also remains to be told. Um, so the lists that you're tracking here, just by virtue of how they were brought together and the kinds of authors they brought to light, are already illuminating for us um, a whole range of histories, just at the turn of the millennium, the recent past, um, that, that beg to be told. So uh, kind of in, in, incredible just to, to see this um, laid out in the way that you do. 250 individual stores, that's, that's incredible. Um, and nationwide, as we can see right here, um, places that you might even not expect, such as Peoria, Arizona. But that's the beauty of this, is um, discovering things that uh, you might not expect. And that was the that was the 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 in, that was why the list was created. Um, the list was created um, by a network of uh, Black folks within the publishing industry that felt very frustrated at um, the kind of parameters that were placed on Black authors and the expectations therein. Um, that often. Um, meant that uh, various subjects that authors wanted to explore in their works were uh, taboo or um, non-starters for a lot of authors. And a lot of authors at this time, the, what was happening here was a convergence of um, Black communities really putting um, their kind of economic heft behind um, certain cultural um, our artifacts like um, this is when hip hop was really picking up and um, hip hop heads were buying the new CDs every week. And um, so what was happening was there was this kind of outgrowth of kind of cultural consumption that was happening. And um, in ways that a, a lot of mainstream publishers were refusing to see. Um, and so a lot of these authors, for example, Omar Tyree and Terry McMillan were doing very innovative uh, ways to be able to reach their audience. Terry McMillan worked at a law firm and at, at night after she was done with her work, she would stay um, after to use their services like uh, their scanner <laughs> um, and their fax machine to be able to uh, send out advertisements for her work. She would uh, target specific African-American um, organizations and um, groups that were in local communities like fraternities and sororities, historically black colleges and universities, um, uh, book clubs and church groups and the like. Um, and she would encourage them to buy her book on mass, but also to invite her to give a talk, to give um, a, a reading of some of her works and those sorts of things. And those kind of communal practices really pushed the, uh, these books and uh, allowed for them to be these uh, kind of cultural interlocutors that um, really showed the economic might of these sorts of stories. Terry McMillan um, is by far one of the most successful um, early 1990s writers uh, of this ilk because her work was able to be adapted for film. Um, the, one of her most standout um, novels, Waiting to Exhale, also had an amazing award-winning soundtrack and there were a lot of other kind of cultural reverberations of this text that allowed for it to remain within the, the kind of cultural conversations of African-Americans. And also keep in mind that um, Essence Magazine was communally consumed. Most uh, people would flip through the magazine as they waited at the hair salon or the barbershop or uh, they were, you know, and other kinds of gathering spaces in, like that. And so this list really became a way for authors to prove that they really were selling um, to communities, but in ways that aren't captured by our traditional techniques. Um, and so that, that was the impetus for creating the list. And um, in addition to, the, to uh, why the list was created, um, it also was a way for these authors to um, to be able to advertise their work because the reality is that 
um, in the same ways that American mainstream publishers were refusing to see the the potentials of these works, the um, mainstream media was not giving very much coverage in the way of reviews, of advertisements, of interviews, and any other kind of promotional um, materials that could be made available to uh, authors in their books. Um, and so this was one of the ways that uh, Black communities were able to keep in the know about what to read and how to have the conversations about those texts. That is wonderfully put. And even in your response, you draw on the whole history of Black bibliography as theory and practice in that lists of Black books um, become a, a source of community knowledge, of validating work produced by the community, but also of, of community outreach, of advertising work. <laughs> Um, by the authors within that community. And it strikes me that um, this is really the heart of the Black bibliographical tradition, at least from Wesley, Dorothy Porter Wesley and Arturo Schomburg, um, if not earlier, but um, you're very much in that tradition of scholarship and of um, uh, grassroots um, uh, literary networking um, that that is also the subject of these lists. Um, our hosts, the BSA, wanted to just to follow up on your wonderful breakdown of how the data was collected. And they wanted to ask, um, is there any overlap between the way Essence compiled this data by calling on these different Black bookstores and perhaps how music kits were tracked? Because uh, the college the College Music Journal, for example, put their hit list together the same way by calling independent record stores for their sales list. So do you see any overlap between um, the way certain music lists um, are brought together by calling independent stores and the way Essence compiled these lists? I do. And I, I think that this is a great uh, place to pause to make sure that we are giving credence to where uh, it is due and that the list published in Essence magazine really began with uh, Blackboard, which is an independent um, bestsellers uh, list, um, and they were contracted to uh, to present the list. And so it was the um, collection process that Blackboard created rather than the magazine. And in 2001, the magazine decided to bring the list in-house and uh, begin to track their own data. Um, and I, I, there are a number of, of whispered reasons for that, but from what I can glean, it was to ensure the integrity of the list and to make sure that um, certain uh, ways that could be could be used to manipulate the list were not um, readily available. Uh, some of the ways that uh, authors would get frustrated um, would, for example, if an author knew which um, bookstores were going to be profiled that month, if they had happened to have a talk at, at one of those or several of those bookstores that month, the likelihood of them ranking on the list would be much higher than if they didn't know that information. And so to ensure that everyone had fair access and fair um, representation on the list, uh, Essence took over. Um, and just, just to back up a little bit more uh, about the history of the list. The list was created um, in 1994, as I said, at, at the 25th anniversary um, of the magazine being in print. This was one of two celebratory endeavors that the magazine took on. The other one was Essence Fest. Um, and this is a music and culture festival that happens here in New Orleans every year, or has been happening every year, uh, save 2020 and 2021 for obvious reasons. Um, but they had a, a virtual um, reconfigurations of the festival um, for both summers. Um, and so both of these, uh, both of these endeavors, I think, really work 
in tandem to show the magazine's breadth of uh, cultural influence and how they were determining what areas to focus on, what media to focus on. The magazine would often feature um, fashion spreads, would feature um, healthy recipes and information and um, pointers on how to uh, do things as, as family, as individuals, um, especially women, the, the magazine was created um, for and by Black women. Um, their motto um, it, at the time that the list was created was uh, Black women first. And so the magazine really uh, was an attempt to uh, talk about um, various aspects of uh, Black social life in ways that felt accessible to Black communities. Um, and so this list uh, is, is truly representative of that. And I think the idea of keeping the list as fair as possible really points to the ways that this uh, list was a, an attempt to um, get not only to capture the literary landscape at this time, but also to make sure that these authors were not um, being left out, that they were able to get their flowers. This list was a, a way that uh, put books on radars of, of various organizations and institutions that arise with pay attention. For example, uh, Omar Tyree, again, um, his follow-up to Fly Girl, uh, one of the most successful independently published titles um, in Black communities of the uh, 1990s, um, was um, an instant bestseller. And um, was very similar um, in the marketing approach to hip hop uh, music. And um, Omar um, very lovingly tell, tells about how he um, called up Simon & Schuster, his long-term uh, publisher, um, when right as he was beginning his marketing campaign and asked them for a drop date. After they picked their jaws up off the floor um, and finally uh, bit up enough courage to ask him what a drop date was, um, they told him that uh, drop dates don't exist in, in um, books, in the books industry. And he said, well, if you can't give me an exact date when my books will be on shelves, can you give me a range? And they said, absolutely, it'll be on the shelf uh, between this time and that time of month. And he said, okay, great. I picked Tuesday. He picked Tuesday because Tuesday is when every hip hop, major hip hop rap R&B album was being released. And they, those were being released because they wanted to take advantage of the Nielsen books, uh, the Nielsen sound scan, excuse me, week. And uh, because that data um, floats directly into the billboard charts. And so in order for your album to chart number one or to chart high, you wanted to give yourself as much uh, lead time as possible. And so um, Tuesdays became a big kind of culture deluge almost every week um, in, at the turn of the 21st century. And so authors um, like Omar realized that this was an opportunity to capitalize on a culture that was already in existence. And so he assumed correctly that authors would, uh, authors, excuse me, fans would go from Sam Goody or FYE or Circuit City or Best Buy or wherever they were buying their album, their CDs and go over to Borders or Barnes and Noble or whatever other large chain was available and would buy the book. And he was absolutely right. The sequel to Fly Girl was one of the best-selling novels um, of 2001. It um, also netted him an NAACP Image Award and a few other book awards that otherwise I'm, I'm not um, very confident that he would have won, um, but I, I do wholeheartedly believe he deserved. And so I think that this list a lot uh, really gave um, credence to authors that would have otherwise been overlooked and um, is really uh, the basis, I think, for us to be able to recover some, some really amazing stories for and about Black people. Well, I'm just in awe of that capsule history of not just 
Tyree's place on this list, but really, and this is where I think your project ramifies um, across BSA, but also across biblio bibliography and the book historical fields, in the sense that the things that Tyree fashioned for himself in conjunction with Black booksellers and recognizing that um, something like Blackboard would, um, and later Essence, would be tracking the numbers of those stores. Let's, you, you mentioned drop date. We could also think about the process of hyping and, and sort of self-promotion. All the things that make literary and musical cultures intertwined in the Black community. Um, the marriage of the commercial with the artistic, even on the page that you you're, you're showing us here. All these things have in fact become staples of literary culture writ large today. It, it is just a fact of our literary culture in the present moment. And as Jacinda and I have known for some time in our own respective fields, this is something that 1990s into 2000s independent DIY Black writers were already thinking about and already had their fingers on because they saw how um, literary culture and commercial culture could be usefully intertwining. Um, and boy, you really just show that in, in focusing on Tyree and bringing to light the different things he did to, in fact, teach Simon & Schuster something, right, about yeah. how to do this thing. And guess what? It's how everyone does it these days. It truly is, from Colson Whitehead to Celeste Ng, it's how we all do it. So th this is really where your research and Black independent writers of the 90s and 2000s paved the way for what everybody does now. Do you have something to say about that? I do, I do. I, a, a, a quick anecdote that he gave to that story is that um, within a few months of him beginning his campaign, the first Harry Potter midnight book uh, party idea, a drop date, if you will, was, um, was created. Um, and so he feels as if um, Scholastic Books did see what he was doing because he was going around the country on a promotion tour. Um, and he would go to radio stations and television stations and anyone else who would have him, HBCUs, like I said, um, fraternity and sorority groups, anyone who would listen. And he had keychains and t-shirts and book, uh, bu uh, <clears throat> book flyers and all types of other kind of promotional materials. But uh, all of this kind of campaign got subsumed under uh, the, the massive weight of Harry Potter in that series. Um, and so he, he, he really, um, and I, I checked the numbers, what he's saying really adds up. And um, so in the sense that he was overwhelmingly successful and I think that it led to some really important flowers for him. It also is quite frustrating to see the ways that these, major publishing houses didn't really learn from him. And what we have seen over time is that a lot of the authors on this list grow, went and grew to be quite resentful of the American mainstream uh, publishing industry because this list um, almost was a, a marker of, of, of death, of, of creativity, of um, branching out. Um, once the coldest winter ever was ranked on this list for nearly four years consecutively. Um, everyone, it didn't matter which publisher, everyone expected for African American writers who wanted to be bestsellers to write in the, the frame of either Zane, Terry McMillan, or Sister Soldier. Those were the options, either hypersexuality um, and uh, kind of um, Black erotic uh, stories or stories written about uh, Black women's relationships with uh, friends and um, uh, other uh, romantic relationships or about very urban gritty uh, coming of age narratives for young adults. 
Um, and so there, with, with those kinds of three uh, kind of big expectations, there was not a, a lot of room uh, for authors to be able to, to pivot and move and, and, and that sort of thing. A really kind of difficult example, I think, is with Eric Jerome Dickey, who um, passed away recently. Um, so rest in peace to him. Um, uh, he, in one of the last conversations that I had with him, talked about uh, his frustrations with wanting to write mystery um, stories, mystery and thriller stories, and not being able to um, get buy-in from publishers to do so. Thankfully, he um, one of the last series that he had published was, in fact, um, a mystery and thriller series. But that was, um, I think, in 2016. And so it took more than 20 years for uh, for him to be able to really convince his audience, uh, to, to convince his publishers um, to take a chance on a, on a book like this. And um, we can see the, the, a lot of these authors kind of making various um, decisions, political decisions about this. Uh, again, bringing up Omar Tyree, he has a novel called The Last Street Lit Novel. And that was a very, uh, a very ironic, uh, sarcastic um, book towards a Simon & Schuster's expectation that he continue to write street lit novels. Um, and uh, keep in mind that what was really interesting, I think, about this precarious situation that Black authors found themselves in is that they were they were faced with bad deals in the same ways that a lot of uh, hip hop musicians got bad deals when they uh, were signed initially to major music labels. In that they they were able to get six figure advances for multiple book contracts. Um, but then when it came time to write those books, a lot of the authors became frustrated with the parameters for which the, uh, the publishers would accept those, those texts. Um, and so it, it became a very precarious situation where a lot of these authors were publishing a minimum of a book a year, um, but a lot of them were contractual obligation works rather than the ones that they truly wanted to write. Well, and I think this is where um, bibliography as careful study of material artifacts, as you were doing with your copies of The Coldest Winter Ever, can show us the possibilities, but also the problems of mainstream uptake of Black books. Um, the relentless promotion of The Coldest Winter Ever as a kind of story that's supposed to stand in for, for a whole population is something that, um, if I'm not, uh, if I'm correct, Pocket really capitalizes on. And you almost see the hyper-marketization happen from copy to copy to copy through blurbs. And then ironically, even though the book is getting into the hands of more readers, the way it's packaged becomes ever narrower and narrower and narrower because we're getting further and further away from exactly these grassroots communities and readers who brought it to light in the first place who in fact got it into the hands of local communities in the first place. So Jacinda is doing something that at once discovers the books at their moment of general uptake by Black readers, remember, by uh, Black authors for Black readers, but then showing over time the process of mainstream uptake, which inevitably distorts how these books are received and into whose hands they can be um, uh, sort of uh, placed. And you actually see those changes in, in the copies of the books themselves, as I think your soldier example, example showed. 
Absolutely. Um, if you would permit me, I would like to show you a little bit about that. Um, so I'm going to skip forward a few slides. Um, these slides are just to show you what the list looks like, but we can go back to that. I wanted to come to this screen um, as we are talking about the coldest winter ever and its impact. One thing that I found to be extremely interesting is that this, um, the on the list, the overwhelming, uh, most popular version edition of the text was retailed at six dollars and 99 cents this is 35 percent lower than the average uh paperback uh for fiction published on this list and more generally how much books cost this book was uh far closer aligned to how much a cd or um even a single um, CD would cost. And so the idea of a hip hop head spending $7 on a book seemed far more reasonable than spending $17, $18, especially given the demographic of uh, hip hop at that time, which was a youth expressive uh, culture movement um, and, and really targeted at uh, Black and Brown youth. And Sister Soldier being a rapturous a rap activist before writing The Coldest Winter Ever, I think really speaks to the ways that this work was able to transcend the kind of hip hop cultural um, uh, space and, and to really present this work as a hip hop text, but also as uh, Sister Soldier as a hip hop artist through various media. Um, and so uh, what, what I found to be also interesting is that this book, um, this edition of the book was released by um, Simon and Sh excuse me, by Pocketbook. And so the book was actually smaller much smaller than most uh, books that were being published at the time, which was very uh, convenient and appropriate for its target audience. A lot of hip hop heads would consume their media on the go when they were on the train headed to school or to work or wherever they were headed. Um, and they would also, it was also a pass along culture that um, was endemic to hip hop at that time. And so um, it was, it was, yeah, it was very acceptable to spend $7 on a novel. And once you were done with it, pass it on to one of your friends because the conversation that would come from having both read the text was really where the heart of this story lies. And, and so the, the kind of, again, the co cultural reverberations of these texts and the ways that they have been able to remain alive in Black communities really speak to the, the ways that African Americans have created networks, communication networks that uh, look a lot different than what we would assume. And one of, one of the things that I find to be frustrating with the kind of illuminations that this list brings is that at the heart of a majority of these success, successful texts was some kind of innovative marketing or publishing um, technique. And when these books were accepted into American mainstream publishing, all of these sorts of uh, innovative techniques were, were left out. Um, and they still are. And, and I think that we all could very much benefit from re revisiting some of these techniques and re recognizing that these books um, cannot be successful outside of the context in which they were uh, created and initially successful. And so it, it, it becomes woefully unfair, I think, to, to point to the ways that um, there was a boom in publishing and Black publishing and, and the popularity of these sorts of texts. And then um, eventually these sorts of things, we, we see a kind of dying out of the critical mass of these texts. I, I, not to say that, that uh, folks aren't still writing in these genres and, and to success, but the, the kinds of Black book expos that we saw, the uh, book clubs, and um, even Oprah's uh, a television show with her book club, we don't see those kinds of spaces 
for uh, black book promotion anymore. And, and I think that social media is a, a wonderful opportunity for us to see the ways that um, these uh, communities are being reconstituted online and an opportunity for us to look back at uh, what was successful for these authors and books and to, to be able to translate that into uh, 2021. That's great. And we've got a lot of great questions coming in. Um, we will get to them. Aaron and I will get to them shortly. So please keep them coming. Um, and one of our audience members, Raquel, notwithstanding, um, a lot of the books on this list will be mostly unfamiliar um, to this audience. And uh, of course, there's a reason for that. Everything you just described, uh, grassroots movement, black authors who weren't getting a hearing by mainstream publishers, unless they proved to be huge successes like the coldest winter ever. Um, but I wonder if you could share your last slide with just a sampling of the authors and titles on this list. Um, how do you see these essence books, just this list, confirming or challenging ways of thinking about Black literature, right? Um, you know, even noting that Soldier's book was nine times more popular than Paradise, right? How do these lists um, productively challenge the way we conceive of Black writing uh, as such? And in some ways, how does the history that the essence lists point to um, complicate the way academics and scholars value black writing, uh, which are not tend not to be based on what readers want, but based on um, encrusted uh, scholarly notions uh, that privilege that privilege certain aesthetics. So what do you see in, in just even a, a sampling like this as challenging our received notions of Black writing? Absolutely. So that's a great question. I think this list points to the ways that African American authors have been engaging a lot of difficult subjects. For example, um, one of the authors you see here listed is Elin Harris. Elin Harris was one of the first um, African American authors to uh, really push the boundaries of same sex romance um, and to uh, really push uh, uh, and extend things um, that uh, folks like James Baldwin or even Paul Lawrence Dunbar um, took up before um, in the ideas of um, homoeroticism. And I'm also thinking about authors like Zane, who was the um, E.L. James, uh, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, well before um, that ever existed. And, and to know that a book like Addicted, her first novel, um, did extremely well, uh, you know, it, it, but it was, uh, and to, to think that it, it did extremely well in the communities in which I was reared um, and I un came to understand the world. But then when I got my copy of Fifty Shades of Grey and I kept looking at it like, this is unoriginal, what, what do you mean? I, this, I, I read that, you know, 20 years ago. What, what are you talking about? How do you not know about Addicted? This really points to the ways that these kind of conversations were intracultural conversations um, and, uh, ones that were truly effective. I'm also um, thinking about B.B. Moore Campbell and a number of other authors who focused on um, concerns of the Black church. This was at the time where there was uh, a rising crisis um, for the Black church and for uh, church folks and, and figuring out how to navigate um, church life and the kind of secular expectations that the world presented, especially in light of the grittiness and the kind of gangsterism that hip hop was was really pushing at that time. Um, and so these authors, I think uh, the 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 ways that they constitute uh, characters and to uh, be able to do a number of different things, I think, just really is incredible. I, another author that I, I must pay um, uh, attention to is Carl Weber. And uh, what's really difficult with uh, Carl is that his name is quite popular um, and not 
um, because of anything that he did. Um, but uh, Carl was a, or is a very successful author, but he also owned uh, at least 10 bookstores across the uh, Northeast at one point. He, uh, there's a profile in Vibe magazine calling him the P Diddy, or I think at the time it was Pub Daddy, of uh, Black books. And I think it's such a deserving title because not only did he own Black bookstores and wrote Black books, but he also became a publisher in his own right because he saw the, the impact of this list. He saw the need um, to ensure that these networks and communities were sustained and really uh, just got into the kind of book, you know, scene and, and did some incredible innovative work. And so I think the, the thread that all of these books you know, A Devil in a Blue Dress by Walter Mosley was adapted for film, and it was one of Denzel Washington's most early films, and I think that it was a wonderful depiction and also a, um, a, a great foreshadowing for how um, a number of these texts became ripe for film adaptation, and I can't help but to get extremely excited at the possibilities of seeing um, spaces like Netflix uh, saying that they are pushing for more um, film adaptations from novels. And I'm really hoping that these texts will be considered uh, when, when they are doing dig deep dives into archives to figure out which books would be great candidates for those adaptations. Absolutely. This is, as you've described it, a kind of alternate canon or an anti-canon of Black writing that, amazingly enough, tracks the official canonization of African-American literature in the Academy, 94 to 2010. These are the central years of the steady canonization of official African-American literature. And yet Essence is tracking, if you will, a shadow canon or a shadow field that none, that if I can put the point bluntly, essentially places at its center black readers. And that's just not what at least traditional academic conventions define any literature around, right? It's it's usually based on aesthetic questions and standards or period questions and standards. But here you really see the value of what happens when the question of readers and readers historically disadvantage is placed at the center of analysis. And it kind of opens up your whole world to what literary culture can look like. Um, we certainly see that in the books and the titles. There's far more genre fiction here than you would ever see in a, a classic uh, literary syllabus. Uh, we've talked a little bit about booksellers, but the final thing I wanna touch on before we turn it to you all is the question that you raised briefly through Carl Weber of black publishing and black self-publishing. Because it seems to me that in your list, you certainly have imprints like Doubleday and Dutton. Then you have little known today, but very important Black oriented imprints like Dafina and Atria. And then finally, this is almost the, 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 the real sort of <laughs> kind of exciting part. Um, indie and, and DIY publishing imprints like Triple Crown and Express Yourself. Um, can you tell us what this mixture uh, might reveal about Black writing during this period? I mean, it's such an incredible range. Again, the control here is Black readers and Essence's readers. And yet through that control, we have these various striations in the publishing industry. So. Talk to us about the variation you see from Triple Crown all the way to Double Day. Absolutely. So um, I, I hinted at this earlier in the, the ways that uh, technology really um, 
spearheaded a, a lot of what these authors were able to do. Um, we are looking at the rise of uh, micro publishing with the creation of Kinko's and other kind of mom and pop copy shops, uh, which allowed for Black authors to circumvent a lot of the publishing industry's gatekeeping mechanisms to directly reach Black audiences. Um, and so a lot of these texts were, were originally created as independently published manuscripts. Um, I'm, uh, one Fly Girl uh, was definitely one of those. The reason why um, Fly Girl was re-released uh, from Simon & Schuster is because um, of one of the reps from Simon & Schuster happened to call Caribou Coffee one day uh, and say, hey, uh, what are some books that we don't know about that we should be paying attention to? And the uh, owner said, this kid, Omar, he's, he's at Howard and he has this book that he printed off himself and he's selling them like hotcakes. You really need to pay attention to him. And so a lot of authors um, found that they uh, could once they got a sense of what the publishing industry looked like, felt like it was their duty to be able to widen the access to uh, for other publishers. So a number of them, including Carl Weber, created their own um, publishing imprints specifically to ensure that the, the difficulties that they faced as authors wouldn't be passed along to the, the, uh, the authors coming behind them. And so this list, as you say, really points to the ways that um, the little guy doesn't get left out, right? And that um, the kinds of priorities that Black readers had had little to do with name recognition for, from a lot of these um, publishers, but had to do with uh, whether these stories resonate, resonated with um, their predilections and what have you. And I think one of the, the really innovative things that a lot of these publishers did was to realize that um, system involved incarcerated uh, folks were really a, an incredible captive audience that was overlooked. And a lot of, um, a number of the smaller imprints um, like Weber's um, and like Terry, uh, Terry Woods's um, imprint and a number of others began working with system involved um, authors to ensure that their stories were being told because um, what was happening is that uh, a lot of uh, persons behind bars were realizing how popular these, these narratives were. And these narratives oftentimes paralleled with some of their realities. And they, they felt as if, you know, they were the best equipped to be able to tell these stories. And, uh, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. And so a lot of the, the um, publishers uh, the smaller imprints were willing to work with these authors. And I, what I find to be interesting is the ways that some of the mainstream publishers realized that that, that was a missing audience um, that, that they overlooked and would create things like um, Striver's Row, which I believe is was an imprint of um, Penguin Books. And today, uh, well, the last time that I spoke to representatives over at Penguin about Strivers Row, um, it was it, it, the, the ways that, that it has been historicized uh, le leave a lot to be desired. That's incredible. It's as though this grassroots and path-breaking effort is once again the thing alerting the mainstream to where the energy is at and where readers who have long been reading and where customers who have long been buying books have completely escaped the attention of not just mainstream publishers, but lest it be uh, go unspoken, the New York Times bestseller list and Publishers Weekly Absolutely. and Nielsen and Billboard. I mean, this is really a methodologically a different way of thinking about book sales and readerships that PW and New York Times simply at this point in your history are not um, able to um, assess. So at this point, Jacinda, I, I do have a concluding question that I want to get to, but I'm going to invite Aaron 
of BSA to ask questions to both of us from you all, from the audience. And uh, so Erin is back. Erin, please take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to name myself here so you all don't think that I am the BSA. Um, so I, I want to follow up on Kenohi's comments to um, with a question from the audience that I thought was really in interesting. Um, it's from Heidi Nobles, and I'm going to start at the end of the question and then sort of um, bounce back to the beginning. Uh, so she wonders if it's possible that the essence lists were actually more accurate than Nielsen in general. Um, and, and also if that possibility matters, and, and now I'll bounce back a little to some of the qualifying information she gave. Um, so um, in the only way to get numbers that were easy to get past an acquisitions company would be to call in a favor from an editor at the actual publishing house and get the live numbers off the record. Um, because there are so many heated debates about the accuracy of those Nielsen lists or Nielsen numbers. And I would also say probably Publishers Weekly and, and New York Times as well. So sort of continuing that conversation about publishers, do you want to speak to that? Oh, certainly, uh, yes. So that, uh, I, I, I'm hesitant to say that this is a more accurate list because as I said before, this list was subject to um, some manipulation um, at times. And um, there were times uh, I, that, for example, in 2007, 2008, around the recession, where these the numbers between the number one book and the number five book could be um, as few as 15 being sold. And so it, 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 there was kind of ebb and flow with, with some of it, but I think that rather than looking at this as um, a specific um, numbers uh, kind of thing, I think that if we look at the kind of relative um, impact of the of the story to, to look at um, how many times the same title gets ranked on the list, whether a title is ranked on the list as a hardcover and then again as a paperback, um, whether the price for that book has changed over the times that it gets ranked on the list. I think those sorts of um, small kind of bibliographical details really point to the impact of the work. But I think, again, going back to The Coldest Winter Ever as an example, the book got more expensive over time. Um, and I, I think that that points to this kind of inversion of uh, histories that we're used to seeing. Um, and so rather than looking at the, at the accuracy of the list and, and how um, it specifically is looking at numbers, because the reality is that this could not capture all of the sales information um, that was available because it, but the lion's share of these books were being sold at the places like Black Book Expos where the author was responsible for selling the books. And so they would um, get, you know, boxes and boxes of their own copies of their own books. And then they would go out to sell them to individuals at, at you know, out of the trunk of their cars, on street corners, at Black Books Expos, at homecoming events and the like. And when they did so, it really took them out of the kind of realm of capture. For, for these sorts of techniques. And, and because of that, I think this list had, shows more about the impact of these texts and the longevity of the text rather than um, the specific numbers. You know? So like the, the rank of one versus five to me feels less significant than the idea that this, this book was ranked several times on the list. Kanohi, do you wanna speak to that as well? Uh, no. Okay, That's on to the next question. Um, so this is from Julie Enzer. Uh, how can information 
how can this information that you, you're gathering, Jacinta, be used to challenge publishers to acquire and pay Black authors fairly? Um, I think one of the things that I get so much out of this conversation with, especially as somebody who works with 20th century materials, is that like this is so relevant. These people are still living now, um, you know, in the bibliographical community that I came up in. It is very much talking about a lot of people who've been dead for a zillion years. And I think what's one of the most exciting things about your work is that you know, this is, this is, and I love this question because it, it really shows how relevant and how, you know, this is bibliography happening and being relevant to right now. So forgive my additional gloss, but what do you think? I absolutely, I, I concur. Um, I think that this is a great way to shamelessly plug the second interview for this series, um, which is with uh, Virginia DeBerry and Donna Grant, to uh, best friends who are best-selling novelists. Their three bestsellers um, that were ranked on this list are being re-released by um, St. Martin's Press uh, very shortly. Um, and so our conversation will be ahead of these re-releases. And Simon, uh, Simon, uh, St. Martin's Press indicated that they would like to republish these titles um, given the outcry for um, stories for and about um, Black people, specifically in the wake of the death of George Floyd last summer. And so uh, I think that you're absolutely right. The fact that we can have conversations with these authors is a really important um, note about these uh, <clears throat> about this list and the, the kind of timeliness of the Essence Book Project. Um, unfortunately, the woman credited for creating the scheme for the list, the data schema for the list, uh, passed away in September. Um, her, uh, Eric Jerome Dickey, uh, Elin Harris, a number of these authors were losing them. And so we're at a critical point where it's necessary for us to do this recovery work before we lose out on the opportunities to make sure that, um, that these authors really are able to get their just due. And so I would say that um, my biggest hope is that in um, in us attempting to revive uh, I, uh, titles from this list and to uh, revisit these sorts of, of works, I, I would hope that authors like, uh, excuse me, imprints like um, St. Martin's Press will uh, do um, the right thing and to make sure that they are um, providing these authors with good deals and um, that they are ensuring that um, they are accurately paying these authors for their work and making sure that they're, they're, the ways that they promote these texts are aligned with the, the, the mechanisms for which the, these kinds of texts are consumed. Um, and so I, my, 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 I'm very excited at the thought that these texts are getting a second life, but I'm also very nervous um, that history will repeat itself. I'm, I'm also wary of history repeating itself, but I think that Jacinda offers us here a way of um, highlighting continuity under the radar of the mainstream um, that, that is uh, productive and that is community centered. And what I mean by that is if you all will just look at your graph here, um, a reprint of a, um, well, not, a, excuse me, not a reprint, but a novel by the author Dorothy West, The Wedding, appears on this list, even though it doesn't appear in mainstream bestseller lists during this time. And what's very important about the appearance of the wedding right here on your graph is that it registers um, a veteran of the Harlem Renaissance returning into print after 47 years. And it is this black bestseller list that recognizes that, not the New York Times or Publishers Weekly. By the way, I didn't know Jacinda was gonna share this graph with you, but it just goes to show 
how it is this list that recognizes the return of Dorothy West and not the mainstream. And what just what I heard Jacinda just say is that her work for the Essence Book Project is one guide for contemporary publishers to realize they don't necessarily have to look for new voices or the hottest thing out there. It's under their noses. And in some ways, the most ethical thing to do is actually just to go back to these lists because many of our these authors are still with us, although we are losing some, and perhaps do right by them because guess what? These authors had big audiences and for many of them still do. And while I'm very much about promoting new and emergent voices, why can't we make it both and? both promoting new and emerging voices, but also going back to these lists who flew under the radar. Um, some of them came to the mainstream, but many did not. And this is a great opportunity to say, it's not just about the new and the best. It's, all, it's also about recovering those who um, were recognized by the black press in its time, um, but may have fallen by the wayside, like Dorothy West. Very well put, thank you. Absolutely, I concur. Um, I'll move on to the next question here. This is at the one of the, the very first one that came in. Um, it's turning back to the list of black bookstores. Seymour Brown says that it's in itself that list is very interesting. How many of those stores can still be found now that Amazon dominates? I wonder, I'll sort of add an other add-on is like as someone who's worked in DH, I, in some ways, I wonder if you've thought about any kind of like geotagging or as like a expansion of the project some, someday to like locate those stores and find out how they connect to each other as, you know, a, a network of, a physical network of, of people in exchange. So I have not had the occasion, as I said earlier, this project is still um, ongoing. Uh, one thing that I, I would like to point to that has been simply amazing is one, to say thank you to my research assistant, Amber, who has just been extremely wonderful. She curates the Essence Book Project uh, Twitter and Instagram feeds and has been doing a wonderful job showcasing the various bookstores um, that are included on the list and where relevant has been tagging the stores that still exist. Um, and I say where relevant because the reality is that uh, the lion's share of these bookstores are no longer in existence. The uh, recession of 2008 and the advent of the ebook um, in 2007 really eviscerated this, um, this hefty community. And so a lot of the ways that um, Black communities were invested in consuming these books at the turn of the 21st century um, with the rise of, um, of social media and uh, video gaming. We don't see as many readers um, as we once saw or in the, the kind of demand for these sorts of books. We, we don't see that, but I, what it was giving me hope is that the Essence Book Project is in great conversation with a number of social media driven uh, platforms that focus specifically on black books. I'm thinking um, of one of my cousins who has an amazing um, Instagram page. She used to call herself the black Emily Dickinson and I, I think she, I, she changed it recently. Um, but uh, what she's been able to do what um, no name um, gypsy has been doing with her um, uh, initiatives with black books and um, prison involved uh, readers has been incredible. I think that we are on the precipice of um, creating something that is similar um, to the Essence book uh, list um, for the 21st, the 2021, excuse me, not just the 21st century. Um, but I, I think that it, it, we, we do need to find a way um, to have some kind of central um, kind of list or, or uh, collecting mechanism so that what we are talking about here, how this is kind of this hidden um, right in front of our faces, um, literary landscape, we we're not saying in another 20, 
to 30 years and that we are not doing the same things to the um, to the writers who are taking advantage of this boom in, in black publishing today. Um, so uh, it's it's a both and answer for me that we certainly um, should be celebrating these authors, especially while they are still with us, but we also need to recognize that the utility of such lists still exists today and that we need to make sure that in, in the ways that black bookstores may not exist in the ways that they did previously, we have to find ways um, to take advantage of the ways that black books are being um, circulated within communities, even if that's on social media. I love that so much, um, especially, you know, I, I really love thinking about what you said earlier about, you know, the, the um, you know, sort of the reader's copy and, and that books would pass from one person to the next or, you know, the copy of either the magazine or, or the book that gets handed from one person to another um, in, in a barbershop and like that's got to still be happening, you know. Uh, you know, I go to my dentist's office and it's crappy magazines that you're trying to <laughs> distract yourself with. Uh, and, and, and this is this is much more interesting, but, you know, it's still happening. Um, so I'm going to ask another question now from Heidi Nobles, and she's wondering if um, Dr. Saffold, you'd be willing to talk about the tensions for a Black author in terms of negotiating the practical advantages of social recognition, so like through the mainstream publishing or the essence list, and what you're noting about the potential losses of creative freedom, so moving into success. So um, whether the mainstream publishers, whether, whether success is defined by being flagged by a mainstream publisher or by being on the essence list. So maybe through the idea you've raised of how authors are navigated through contractual obligations versus the books they truly want to write. Yeah, I, I, that's a really difficult um, question to answer. I think it is far more nuanced than we have time to get into because I think each author that I speak with and the more of them that I get a chance to speak with, I, I just, I am more delighted because I have more questions um, than I'm getting answers. And I think that that really speaks to the import of this project. Um, but I, I think that what I've, I've found is that these authors vary, you know, and, and like you said, it really depends on um, their, their barometer for success and what they were attempting to do when they uh, sat down to write their books. Um, and so some authors really wanted to, to be successful and wanted to make sure that their uh, works were um, selling out um, in stores. And some authors felt like they, they had a story to tell and, a, and that there was someone who needed to read this story, that these stories would resonate, that these stories would be authentic to the sorts of experiences that um, they were faced with and, and out of frustration that the text that they were being encouraged to read um, didn't represent, you know, uh, the, their realities or um, their understandings of Black life. And so I, I, the and, and, you know, some authors were really invested, uh, for example, Zane was very invested in the kind of sexual liberation that her works could provide. Um, as the daughter of a, of a preacher, you know, Zane really pushed the boundaries of, of what it meant to be a churched Black person and what was appropriate to write about. And so it, it really just depended on the specific author for what their motivations were. Some authors um, were happy to be on the list and would uh, flout it um, and ensure that their publishers would flout that they were um, essence bestsellers on their book titles and, and the like. And then some authors wanted very little to do with the list at all. So it, it really runs the gamut. Well, I think we have time for one more question. So I will put this one from Raquel Jeter out there. And I, I hope I'm getting everyone's names right. I've really liked Raquel's comments too, because clearly this is coming from someone who is buying 
books as they as they came out. Uh, she remembers being in Barnes and Nobles looking past books that cost $17 and picking up the books that were $7 no matter who the author was. Um, Jacinta, you talked about there being a gap in the in pricing. Can you talk a little bit more about whether that was a successful marketing strategy for Black books, or you know, just I'd be, just be in, interested in your comments in general about pricing? And I mean, I, that's yeah, another one where it's like, let's bite this off in seven minutes. But do your best, and thanks a lot. Well, one, thanks. Thank you, Raquel, for um, joining today and see more too. You guys always have wonderful questions. Those are two of my students. So thank you both. Um, and to answer your question, it was uh, a little bit of both. Um, I think that the coldest winter ever and its um, low price set the standard for a lot of um, pulp fiction um, books and what we saw in the wake of um, the coldest winter ever success, the commercial success was um, uh, the rise of uh, pulp editions of books and a lot of books didn't go through the normal publishing um, channel of, uh, you know, high quality hardcover and then uh, uh, kind of trade type of um, a book and then, you know, eventually going down to cheaper and cheaper books, they would just come out straight as a, as a pulp uh, paperback um, book. And for a time, this was successful because um, of the hyper consumerist um, culture in hip hop. And so it, it really encouraged um, higher sales volume, which was the focus at that time. But eventually, this became the marker of death for a lot of these books, because, uh, especially with the rise of electronic books. What ended up happening is that this low price really um, indicated to a lot of publishers that these were throwaway books, that these were giveaway books. And so with the creation of, um, of Nook, of other e-readers and online um, uh, marketplaces for electronic books. A lot of these books became the ones that were available for download for free or included in your subscription at no additional charge, which effectively means that these authors were not public, were not uh, profiting from their work and um, had spent, you know, decades um, and lots of time and effort working on these texts. And because of the kind of cultural moment in which they were published, um, that that the uh, the volume of sales meant more than the um, margin for profit meant that um, in the next iteration of books, uh, you know, with as digital books, they became at one point, you could um, buy majority of these titles for a penny on Amazon. Um, and that's not true today, which is a very interesting thing. I think that the, the prices oftentimes are fluctuating in ways that I think we would assume we, we wouldn't see. But the, the idea that these books were being sold for pennies on the dollar, it just seems woefully disrespectful to the kind of impact that these texts had. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Kenohi for the last question. And before I do, I just want to take a moment to, while my face is showing, thank you both so much for just an incredible conversation. Um, and also remind the folks that are still here that I will be putting a link in the chat to the registration pages for all of the upcoming events. There are two there already, but I'll put the link to the page that shows the whole series and what this is all about. Because if you've enjoyed this, I feel like it really has been a taster for the two coming up. So thank you both and Kenohi, please take it away. Thank you. I'm gonna keep this short because indeed, I wanna emphasize that this is a trilogy. This is a series that Jacinta and BSA are um, presenting to the public. And um, I, for one, will be back for the other two. I have so many more questions. You know, One of our participants in the audience is the distinguished historian of black bibliography, Laura Helton. And I almost imagine Laura coming back in one of the next two um, events sort of asking about the woman who created the data scheme. 
Jacinta, that you just mentioned. But listen, folks, you'll get to hear more about the woman who created the data scheme for these lists in other sessions, because this is just the taster. And I want to be back, and I know you do too. But for now, let me just ask Jacinta, you mentioned a book. What's the future of the Essence Book Project? I heard a book in there, your manuscript, but just give us a taste of what's the future of the Essence Book Project? What do you want to use it for as a way of rounding out today's session? Uh, that's a great, great question. So there are so many things that I want to do with this. Uh, I, but I, I, the reason for me, the motivation for me with this project has been to celebrate these authors in the ways that they deserve best. And so I am taking my lead from them. And I have um, been told by a number of these bestsellers that they are having an extremely difficult time finding a home, a physical home for uh, archival space for their uh, papers, manuscripts, and ephemera tied to these novels or to, to these books, I should say. Um, and so one of the, the big things that I have been pushing for is to find um, an archive that would be willing to partner with the Essence Book Project to create a physical repository to and, and have um, these authors send in their, their materials because um, I cannot imagine that scholars will not be taking up these texts in the next 20 and 30 years and we deserve to have access to how these stories were created so that's the first thing a pie in the sky dream for me would be um, to do some celebratory activities um, during the next essence fest when essence fest is in person again i would love to have a stage, a platform, an opportunity to be able to bring some of these authors and the editors and publishers and all those involved in creating this list to have conversations about these texts, um, the import of this list and um, the future of Black books and how um, culture spaces like Essence can support. Wow. Um... Folks, this is a call to action from Jacinda uh, regarding the importance of Black archives to this project uh, and that linking data and compiling lists must also have a kind of physical component to it. And um, I, for one, will be taking this to heart and I hope all of you will help me in, in thinking about what Jacinda just asked of the field, the profession of us. But I also hear an invitation, which is to book our tickets to Essence Fest when something like this can come together. And I know Aaron and BSA and I will very much be supportive of such a thing. And I hope you all will be too. So with that, Jacinda Saffold, thank you so much for kicking off your series with me. Round of applause. And we look forward to joining you for the other two events in your series. Congratulations, Jacinda. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm so glad that you were responsive to my call. Um, I am very grateful for your wonderfully thoughtful questions. Um, I, I am grateful for your help to illuminate um, the possibilities of this project and the import that I've held uh, very close to my heart for the last six or seven years with uh, working on this project. And, and I couldn't have uh, picked a better person to help me introduce this to a wider public. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kenohi. Thank you, Jacinta. And thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon. Thank you all. See you soon.